Now, the latest from ITV News in the Channel Islands with Jess Dunstan and James Webster. Hello there, welcome to ITV News. The headlines on channel tonight. Jersey French relations at breaking point. Emergency meetings, planned blockades and even the suggestion of cutting off Jersey's electricity supply. All over a row about fishing rights. If they blockade the, the harbour here in Jersey, it's, it's almost an act of war to cut off the supply lines. More on the fishing fury that's getting Jersey's government into deeper water coming up. Also on the programme. A second death on Guernsey's roads in as many weeks. Our reporter is live at the scene of the crash. Plus, hard times for the high street. A new report reveals islanders just aren't returning to the shops. And after a five-month wait, it's curtain up at a Jersey theatre. Good evening. A row about fishing rights in Jersey waters has reached breaking point tonight. A new fishing licence system came into force at the weekend, which limits what French boats can catch in Bailiwick waters, and the French aren't happy. So much so that the honorary French consulate in Jersey has shut its doors in protest, and the French are reportedly planning a blockade, arguing the restrictions placed on licences are tighter than originally agreed. There are even reports in the French media encouraging officials to switch off the electricity supply to the Channel Islands. Caroline Lewis reports now on what is fast becoming an entente discordiale. Jating the management <laughs> of Jersey's waters. It's been a long-running row since Brexit discussions began. But after the island took control of its seas this weekend, tensions with French fishermen are mounting. If they blockade the the harbour here in Jersey, it's, it's almost an act of war to cut off the supply lines. Mm. It's all intimidation and bullying tactics. As of Saturday, French boats wanting to access Jersey's waters are now required to hold a licence, something Jersey's fishermen say is necessary to protect the island's future. We really need to look after our territorial seas for future generations. There's no question about that. So that, uh, that the French fleet that have received licences just need to work w within the terms of those licences. But a fresh row erupted last night after officials in Normandy claimed the new rules were not what had been agreed. And the region is now severing ties with Jersey when it announced that the Maison de Normandie, which houses the honorary French consulate, would be closing after 25 years. We decided to express our incomprehension when it comes to the decisions that were taken unilaterally over the issues with the fishermen. We really need to sort things out and fast, otherwise I fear there could be big issues which none of us want. But Jersey's fishermen say the new licences are fair, and they're urging the government to stand its ground. If Jersey uh, capitulates every time that the minister tries to introduce a, a new measure for sustainability, we will have the same reaction from the French. He will leave behind a legacy uh, of just incompetence. Talks have been taking place in Jersey today to try and de-escalate the situation. But with French fishermen reportedly calling for the island's electricity to be cut, there may be a long road ahead. Well, some quite strong words there from the Fishing Association for the Islands External Relations Minister at what is a fractious time. Well, I'm joined by the man himself now, Senator Ian Gorst. Senator, it seems like a complete breakdown of the relationship between Jersey and Normandy. Is this one that's salvageable? Uh, it's a very serious situation and we are taking it very seriously. Uh, we've been speaking with the UK, communicating with the EU Commission. I'll be speaking to the uh, French tomorrow. What's become apparent over the course of the last tw 24 hours is that there's confusion about the information which has been provided through the official channel and that's had implications for the licences which have been issued. 
Well, the French have said that what they've been given isn't what they had in conversation with you. Is that the case? No, I've been absolutely clear all along that Jersey would issue licences in line with what we might call the new Brexit agreement. Uh, what's become clear is that there's a threshold to get a licence, that's 10 days over the course of three years, and then in order to have exactly the same amount of fishing that you might have had in that period as well, you need to provide further data. That data for 14 of the uh, 17, sorry, of the 41 licences issued has not been provided. So we need to find a way of dealing with that issue so that those licences can be amended accordingly if that is in line with the New Deal. Well, we've heard reports that French fishermen are calling for the island's electricity supply to, cut, to be cut off, which could have repercussions you know, in Guernsey as well. You know, what are you doing to protect islanders? Well, we've heard all sorts of uh, accusations and threats. It's not the first time when the uh, new Brexit deal was first signed. We heard uh, similar ones. What's important for us today is to make sure uh, that we are able to deal with the technical issues, and they are very technical issues, uh, so that French fishermen as well as Jersey fishermen can have their historic rights protected, which is what we think the tech does and we think that the licenses that we've issued and we can amend uh, will do so. Senator, thank you. Well, as I said, obviously quite a fractious situation and not one that's going to be resolved overnight, but with relations between Jersey and Normandy still hanging by a thread, we'll have to wait and see what the longer term implications just might be. Yeah, more to come, I'm sure. Thanks, Caroline. Next tonight, there has been a second death on Guernsey's roads in as many weeks. Last night, a motorcyclist died in Cattell after colliding with a bus. Kate Prout joins us live now from the scene. Kate, what more can you tell us? Well, we have very few details at the moment. We had no fresh information from the state's police today. But what we understand is that a bus was travelling up Rectory Hill yesterday evening about quarter to six, we think heading towards Cattell hospital and it collided with a motorcyclist we believe coming the opposite way and unfortunately that motorcyclist died at the scene. Uh, three, all three emergency services were called here but they were unable to save his life uh, and the road was obviously closed for several hours while accident investigators examined the scene. As you say this is the second fatality on Guernsey's roads in as many weeks. You might remember on Tuesday the 20th of April a car with five people on board overturned on the coast road at Vazon. Sadly a 19 year old passenger died. Two other passengers sustained serious but not life-threatening injuries. And then later, the 28-year-old driver was arrested on suspicion of some serious driving offences. And then in another turn last night, there was another uh, incident on the seafront near St Peterport when a female driver about one o'clock this morning managed to crash her car and completely take out a bus shelter. She was then taken to hospital with her injuries. We understand the state's police will give us more information tomorrow morning, but yet another Guernsey family tonight morning, the loss of a loved one. Thanks, Kate. The deans of Jersey and Guernsey have both written open letters urging people to come forward with information about any abuse within the church. It's part of a review into past cases and follows the conviction of the Guernsey vicar John Moore for serious sexual assault. We are looking at every past case of abuse or alleged abuse uh, really to ensure that uh, that this work has been properly managed and most importantly to ensure that the voice of survivors and victims is at the heart of our conversations moving forward. Jersey's coronavirus helpline is reducing its hours from today. It's now open until 6pm on weeknights and between 10 and 4 on weekends. More calls are received earlier in the day with fewer in the evenings. Well, let's take a look at the latest coronavirus figures now. In Jersey, the number of active cases is down to two, with no new cases since before the weekend. And in Guernsey, there are still no active cases. With enforced closures and social distancing limiting the number of customers, our shops have been particularly badly affected by coronavirus. Now, a new plan is being put in place to breathe new life into St Helier's town centre. Top of the list, making the high street a more vibrant place to be. Businesses will get more support and the government is doing what it can to bring customers back and encourage them to spend their money. Eastland Jones reports. The high street was suffering before the pandemic, with online retail growing at the expense of footfall. 
In the last decade, the contribution of retail to the island's economy dropped from 7.3% in 2010 to 6.7% in 2018, while the number of jobs in the sector dropped from 8,500 to just over 7,000. During 2020, that only got worse, with footfall hitting a new low, but more importantly, not fully recovering as restrictions eased. Parcel deliveries in April 2020 alone outdid the amounts handled in November and December 2019. Combined by September, the amount of deliveries was still up by one third on the year before. Footfall, on the other hand, was still just 60% of what it was in June 2019. The pandemic has only accelerated something that was happening anyway. We've all seen reports about three years of growth in three months. And you, you can't hold the tide back on that. But what you can do is use digital use technology to address that for the physical high street as well as online. Many businesses have worked on getting themselves online in the last few years. They too have noticed a change in the demographic of online shoppers in the last year. I think it's here to stay and I think it's just a new way of living and I, I think that's cross-generational as well. So obviously uh, Generation Z or Millennials or whatever have become very used to shopping online and maybe not even using town at all. It's a much older generation, those who have retired now who maybe were frightened of buying online are now buying online because they've become comfortable with doing that. To tackle the rapid changes, government is focusing on four strategies. They'll allocate a policy officer to act as a link between the retail sector and government. There'll be greater focus on developing retail data on footfall as well as spending. Business support for the sector will be increased through Jersey Business and the Interim Island Plan will work to ensure continued focus on delivering a more attractive town centre destination. I think the strategy provides us with a baseline. Um, it's proposing... Um, new data collation and it's really important that whatever plan we can produce and hopefully uh, the Chamber of Commerce and, and the, all Jersey retailers will be alongside the government, we, we have to develop a shared vision about what the future could hold for us. And, the first step to that is uh, by research. The rise of online has made shopping simpler for consumers. For retailers, it's piled on the pressure. Combined with a pandemic, the speed of change just went up a gear, with keeping up the biggest challenge. Now, in terms of bringing people into town, alignment with that island plan is going to be key. There's talk of making town more of an experience and uh, with increased focus on pedestrianisation, as we've seen here in Broad Street in the last year, which has also now turned into a, a temporary oasis. So more uh, entertainment, more culture could be making its way to town. But the flip side of uh, something like this, of course, is accessibility. And uh, one retailer today told me, uh, for example, that accessibility was much more important to him than entertainment and what that means of course is more parking and uh, better connectivity and that's why that link between government and retailers will be uh, so important to provide a forum for discussion but also a uh, challenge now the pandemic has undoubtedly sped up change uh, here as it has in the rest of the world uh, as well and there's been no hiding from the fact that how we consume has uh, changed the challenge for the future will be, be to make sure that local retailers are able to uh, embrace and also capitalise on that change. Indeed, interesting stuff. Thanks, Aislinn. Now, with more of us working from home during the pandemic, the need for a fast internet connection has never been more important. While Jersey has spent more than £50 million upgrading its network over the past decade, Guernsey is lagging behind, especially outside of town. But plans to boost the island's broadband are underway and will be presented to the states in the coming months. And businesses say it can't come soon enough. Louisa Britton reports. Broadband provision is of course crucial to attracting and maintaining business on the island, as well as residents' day-to-day -day lives. But some in Guernsey are concerned we're years behind other parts of the world, including the UK and Jersey, when it comes to internet speeds. Well, we're very much behind, unfortunately, um, which shouldn't be the case. If anything, we need to be pushing an advantage. We are in a competitive market. I spent uh, yesterday evening um, trying to persuade a business to relocate to Guernsey they hadn't actually heard of the place, they'd heard of Jersey and imagine when they come here and they find they don't even have fibre internet. 
Well, in particular, in light of the pandemic, with more and more employees being asked to work from home during the lockdowns, video calls and meetings became much more part of people's day-to-day -day lives. So here, for instance, in St Peterport, the connection may be fairly sturdy. But that isn't necessarily the case in other parts of the island, and that's something the states say they're working to improve. If we looked at our, um, our direct competitor across the water in Jersey, the broadband speeds are significantly higher uh, and we'd like to get ourselves up to the same standard. It's incredibly important for the economy, not just for business, um, for, for resilience in the event of a pandemic, for example, that's been absolutely essential to have broadband at home. Jersey have already installed fibre, which costs more than £50 million to upgrade. The plants here in Guernsey will soon be put to the States, with work potentially getting started in the end of the year. But in St Peter Port, some businesses say they're already content with the levels of provision. Most people realise that with the quality and calibre of businesses that there are on Guernsey, that it's bound to be good, because if we didn't have good broadband, then uh, it would obviously you know, not be as successful as it is. Shaw said that they invest millions of pounds every year into expanding broadband network in Guernsey. And JT have been approached for comments, but we haven't received a reply. And although internet speeds will vary depending on where residents live and work, it seems it could be a while still until full fibre is rolled out across all parts of the island. Louisa Britton, ITV News. Thanks, Louisa. Now, coming up in just under 15 minutes, it's the ITV Evening News. With the headlines tonight, here's Mary Nightingale. Coming up on the programme, a police officer goes on trial accused of murdering the former footballer Dalian Atkinson. The jury is told he shot at him with a taser for 33 seconds and kicked him twice in the head. The officer denies wrongdoing. Two British soldiers are acquitted of murdering an IRA member as the trial collapses. The row of homes destroyed by an early morning explosion in Kent. And when can we go on holiday? The latest on plans to ease travel restrictions. Well, do join me for that and more at 6.30. Now, let's get the latest sports news. And a busy bank holiday of competition continues this evening. Our sports correspondent, Keelan Webster, is at Lancrest Golf Club for us. Keelan. Yes, you join me on the seventh hole here as the first edition of the Elite Foursomes Championships reaches the semi-final stage. Four pairs all hoping to book their place in tomorrow's final. And we'll show you a little bit of live action in a moment, plus news of a fresh face in at Jersey Reds. Oh, what a serve! And another! <laughs> DHS, proud sponsors of ITV Channel Sport. Well, it is a touch windy out on the course this evening. The sun shining, but still pretty cold, considering we are in early May. It was far less blustery on Saturday when the competition began, and that's when I caught up with Guernsey's golf captain, Dave Jeffrey. It's a new event uh, for the elite uh, players, for the men's squad and for the senior squad. Uh, the idea was to introduce it to give us more competitive golf at that level. Um, it's been organised in a little bit of a hurry. Um, it largely imitates what they do in Jersey, um, but we felt it was important to get a bit of foursomes preparation ahead of the Interinchulars in August and September. Well, currently here on the 7th, as you can see, it's uh, currently all square in the second game. This is between uh, CJ Elmy and Daniel Griggs against Arthur Evans and Ollie Chedham, uh, the youngster. So um, it's all for a place in the final tomorrow. In the other game, it's uh, pretty, a little bit more conclusive so far with uh, Jeremy Nicholl and Jake Marshall three up on Roland Mills and Rory McKenna. But an opportunity um, for one of these pairings to make the breakthrough early on uh, in this hole on the 7th. And uh, perhaps take advantage in towards the back nine. We'll turn to some action in a moment, but let's wrap up the rest of the uh, news from across the Channel Islands now. And Jersey Reds have bolstered their front row options with the loan signing of Joe Morris from Worcester Warriors. The former England under-20 international joins just a couple of days after Reds' victory over Amptill. It was the first time they've won consecutive championship games this season. And director of rugby Harvey Biljohn insists it's a run of form that's been coming. Over the last three, four, five weeks, we've been training really well and we're starting to see that transfer into, into games. Um, you know, we, we're, we're becoming more and more resilient 
And what's even more exciting is that we've got three games to go and two of those games are at home and we're looking, we're really looking forward to it. Guernsey Cricket's Evening League returns tonight with Division 3 matches. The sport came out of hibernation on Saturday with three friendly matches at KG5. Matthew Stokes starred in the inter-club men's game, seeing his side home with a 21-ball 46. Well, it's potentially a pivotal night in the Prio League title race. St Martins know that they can return to the top of the table if they can get three points against Manza. They're currently a point behind leaders Rovers, but tonight's fixture is one of two games in hand. Well, just before we finish up, let's grab a word with Guernsey's goal captain, Dave Jeffrey. Dave, you, you said to me on Saturday, this is all about trying to get those pairings right for the yep. interinsular games later this summer. How do you think it's gone so far? Yeah, I'm very pleased with the pairings that have got through. Um, pretty much gone to the form book uh, in terms of consistency and foursomes. Uh, you can see all teams struggling this evening. Uh, the wind is playing havoc on the greens particularly. Uh, so I, it, it's early stages, only through seven holes, so I can't really call which way either of the game will go at this stage. OK, well, Dave, thank you very much indeed. Of course, all of these pairings would indeed love to get their hands on the trophy, but as you just heard from Dave there, it is more important to work out those pairings for those all-important interinsular competitions later this summer. Yeah, for sure. Keelan, thank you. Great to see some live action on the golf yeah, course it? there. Now, audience has, uh, have returned to the theatre in Jersey for the first time in five months. The island's Arts Centre is now staging performances again following the latest lifting of restrictions. On stage this week, a show called Blue Remembered Hills performed by members of the Jersey Amateur Dramatic Club. There are still limits on how many people are allowed in the auditorium, but those who were there for opening night seemed to enjoy it. Now, 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 go to sleep, Dinah. Back on stage for the first time in months. Oh, yes. Quiet. It's opening night for the Jersey Amateur Dramatic Club and the first live show for the Jersey Arts Centre since the latest lockdown. I have really missed being in the theatre. The theatre is my second home, um, as it is for so many people. You could be my other daughter, Audrey. My naughty daughter. Angela is what they call the pretty one hence the, the lovely ringlets, but it's, it's just bringing out the fun and the excitement that children feel over a leaf, over a stick, over something really simple that as adults we, we end up forgetting about, so it's really nice to go back and uh, tap into that again. You seem uh, dead. Oi, oh, yeah. he's dead all right, dead and dead. Blue Remembered Hills follows a group of seven-year-olds during the war. Dead. They're playing in the woods, having fun and picking on one another, but the rough and tumble soon takes a turn into more serious bullying. Yeah, you're asking for it. You oh, yeah, and he's going to give it away then. Oh, I will. Yeah. yeah. Be careful, yeah. 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 It's challenging for them as actors because although some of it is funny and silly, it does have some very poignant moments that they get to bring through. As, as experienced actors, they have the, the talent to be able to do that. With strict Covid rules in place to protect the cast, crew and audience, it's all meant a new way of working for the actors. It's unique for me, it's like starting again. You have to get used to restrictions on the stage, you have to get used to learning lines again, um, getting an accent that's right, um, and then coming into the theatre and seeing an audience here, albeit a small one, but an audience nevertheless. <laughs> All the right protocols are in place, so anyone coming to the play should be able to relax, uh, enjoy the entertainment that we're going to put on, and hopefully go home having a good feeling about going to the theatre again. The Arts Centre still has to put limits on the size of the audience to allow social distancing. For the crowd of 40 allowed in, it was, though, a welcome return. To be here, not only to be out and about, but supporting friends who, you know, are very passionate about Amdram. So, yeah, it's great. It's really good to see everything's going back to normal again. Well, obviously, uh, huge to be able to, um, to, to congregate together, to be able to see productions, which obviously those folks have been working on for so long. It's massive. I love coming here. I come here with my gran all the time. And, um, yeah, seeing Michelle doing what she loves to do is really nice. <laughs> it's just the beginning getting back to normal, so thoroughly enjoyed it. It'll stink if we leave in there. 
This show runs until Saturday, starting a season of new productions. After a year where so much of the arts has been cancelled, venues like this hope they never again have to endure a closure. Well, the observant, and I mean really observant amongst you, may have noticed a familiar face in that play. It is our very own James, James Webster. Uh, slightly, slightly disguised in the, uh, in the cowboy hat, but I think on the pictures that you can see now, you can probably make me out there, yeah. Been very busy rehearsing, and literally as soon as we're off air, I've got to run to the theatre. Oh, bless you. Great to be back, though, I bet. <laughs> really great. Great. Now, on to the weather. And we've had some spots of rain in the past few days. I wonder if that's brought us out of those drought conditions Sophie was talking about. Here she is with the latest. Making the most of the day. ITV Channel Islands Weather. Sponsored by Shaw. Mobile, broadband and home phone. Well, yes, for more than 20 days, we've had very dry conditions. In fact, last night, eventually, we saw a little bit of rainfall tied up with an area of low pressure just over my shoulder. And this band of rain has swept across Wales and the United Kingdom. Just the very tail end swept across us over the very early hours of this morning and drew us out of the absolute drought. We only needed 0.2 of a millimetre. We got 1.8 millimetres, so still nothing to really sing home about. We've got to wait for a lot more rainfall to help farmers and gardeners. And there's a little bit more on the way over the next few days, more in the form of showers that'll be a bit of a hit and miss affair. So tonight you can see a few showers around, but some fair periods. So temperatures falling away pretty low. We're looking at around six or seven degrees following on from April, which was also a pretty cold month, not record breaking like the United Kingdom, but we saw temperatures on average around nine degrees and 13 ground frosts, which is pretty high to be fair but for tomorrow we see more sunny conditions the uv index could easily climb up to a six or seven yet again some good strong sunshine out there but also interspersed with some cloudier spells and thankfully tomorrow the winds will have eased up a little bit they have been pretty strong today from the northwest looking as though we've got a westerly about a force four to five so feeling a little bit fresh out there we're looking at highs of 11 or 12 degrees the water remains fairly rough though times of high water the other side of midnight around 2 2 30 and the sea temperature is 11.5 degrees so showers really continue on most days this week hopefully as we head into the weekend things cheer up and so do the temperatures itv channel islands weather sponsored by shaw thanks sophie and that is your itv news in the channel islands tonight i'll be back with the latest at 10 30 yes from jess and i have a great evening good night good night